Hi, this is Hallie Caster Jane, and you are listening to the Hallie Caster Jane Show, available at HallieCasterJane.com. The Hallie Caster Jane Show is supported by the following. Welcome to the Hallie Caster Jane Show. I am Hallie Caster Jane. Let's talk. Today on the Hallie Caster Jane Show, as we commemorate National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day and the 75th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, we return to history in World War II with two important stories. When journalist Catherine Smith, author of The Gatekeeper, Missy Lahand, FDR, and the untold story of the partnership that defined a presidency, and historian Mark Wortman, author of 1941, Fighting the Shadow War, join me at my table. But before we begin, the Hallie Caster Chain Show is always available online at HallieCasterChain.com. Who was Missy Lahand? Longtime journalist Catherine Smith answers that question and more in her new book, the first biography of the gatekeeper, Missy Lahand, FDR, and the untold story of the partnership that defined a presidency. According to Smith, Marguerite Missy Lahand, widely considered the first female presidential chief of staff, was the right-hand woman to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, both personally and professionally, for more than 20 years. Although her official title as personal secretary was relatively humble, her power and influence were unparalleled. Lahand was arguably the most influential member of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration. Everyone in the White House knew one truth. If you wanted access to the president, you had to get through Missy. But Catherine Smith insists Lahand has been misrepresented, mischaracterized, and overlooked throughout history. Until now, let's talk. So let's get started. So Catherine, I have to say this. This is such a compelling story, little known by some. But you know, it appears from my own research that Missy had, has to this day, a rather large following of uh, devotees. Uh, Your interest in Miss Lahan (laughs) began when and why? Well, um, I've always been interested in FDR. And I I had a grandfather who's what we call in Georgia a yellow dog Democrat, which means you would vote for a yellow dog if it was on the Democratic ticket. Some even say a dead yellow dog before you'd vote for a Republican. (laughs) And that was all traceable to his hard times during the Great Depression and how he felt life got a lot better after FDR was elected. He just revered FDR, and I sort of came along thinking he was the greatest president of the 20th century, and I still do. But the more I read about him, the more I noticed this woman who was just always right at his right shoulder, um, his right-hand woman. And um, I wanted to read her biography and discovered no one had ever written one. So I said, well, I'll just do it myself. And the result was the gatekeeper. She's fascinating. There's no question about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, give give uh, the audience a little background on her. Where did she come from? What kind of family? And, and, and tell us how she became known as Missy. Okay. <laughs> well, she was from a working class family. She was born in Potsdam, New York, up near the Canadian border. Her grandfather had come over from Ireland during the potato famine on a, what was called a coffin ship because so many people died during the crossing. Family was just of modest means. Her father was a gardener. She was born in Potsdam, but when she was a small child, they moved to a suburb of Boston called Somerville, and that's where she grew up. Just went to public school. She did graduate from high school, which was a a pretty big deal at that time. Sometimes I would read a book that would say, despite having only a high school education, but it's really comparable to what a college education is today. Um, Even Eleanor Roosevelt didn't have a high school education. So she trained to be a secretary at Somerville High School and worked in various jobs over the years. And, And finally, when she was 23, was hired by the campaign for the vice president of one Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That was in 1920. And that's how she met him. He and his, uh, the presidential nominee were demolished by the Republicans, uh, Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge. And afterwards, he decided to go into private sector work on Wall Street and asked Missy to be his secretary. She got the name Missy because his children had a hard time saying Miss Lahand, and it just kind of slid into Missy Lahand, and soon everyone called her Missy Lahand. So, listen, I, you know, and, you know, if, 
isn't isn't fate fascinating? <laughs> you you yeah. never know what's going to come down the pike, right? I mean, uh, there, there there's an yeah. interesting thing. So she uh, goes to work first, I think, for the Democratic Party, and then she kind of wound her way over mm-hmm. right, uh, to, right. to FDR. Establish how powerful her relationship became with the president. She actually moved in and lived in the White House. She lived with the Roosevelts wherever they were from um, about, well, really the mid-1920s. She spent a lot of time alone with FDR after he had polio and was trying to recover and begin to walk again. So that, that created a very tight bond between them. When he went to Warm Springs, Georgia, to where he ultimately set up really the nation's first polio rehab facility, Missy was his constant companion there. Eleanor hardly ever came to Warm Springs. So Missy became his hostess, his secretary, his confidant, his friend. When he was elected governor of New York in 1928, Eleanor invited her to come live in the governor's mansion. So naturally, when he was elected president in 1932, she went to live in the White House. And there were a lot of people around the Roosevelt's who did that. Missy was not singular in that respect. Louis Howe, who was FDR's political advisor, his guru, lived in the White House. Eleanor invited her friend Lorena Hickok to live in the White House. Years later, Harry Hopkins, who was a, a top aide of the president's, came to dinner one night and wasn't feeling well and stayed for three and a half years. <laughs> I love that so, man. <laughs> I know. Right. And Missy said he was the man who came to dinner. Um, <laughs> So it just the Roosevelt's just had this real tight circle about them, and they really sort of subjugated their own lives to the needs um, and ambitions of the Roosevelt's and seemed to be perfectly happy to do that. So we get to this. Such different backgrounds. He moneyed class. Mm-hmm. She humble. Mm-hmm. He did a lot of research. What was the glue that held those two together? The, the relationship was so remarkable for mm-hmm. such an intense period of time. What was the glue? I think one of the really powerful pieces of glue, as you put it, was that Missy understood disability. She'd had rheumatic heart fever as a child, and she had a very damaged heart as a result. So periodically through her life, she would have heart issues, and it would just lay her out flat. She'd be in bed. And she had spent a couple of years as a child in bed recovering from the rheumatic fever. So she understood what it was like to be disabled and just to be not flat from being a healthy person to being a crippled person. She was what you'd call a cardiac cripple. So there was that understanding. They also had a real similar sense of humor and just really liked to just cut up and be silly together. She was a big joker. So was he, like like puns and things like that. But I think she was valuable to him because of her good level-headed sense, her discretion, and her devotion, and it just, it just, they were just really tight. And she understood people. That is so clear throughout your book. Mm. She had mm-hmm. such a sense of people and how to deal with them. Right. <laughs> right? right. I mean, that must, right. yeah. I right. mean, she's, she, read the book if you really want to understand how to manipulate people and get them yeah. on your side. Yeah, and they really didn't know they were being manipulated right. because she just had this gorgeous smile and was so gracious. And I, I just think that people thought they were getting what they wanted through Missy, but really she was getting what she wanted through them. And, and they really never knew it. So I found very few instances of anyone saying anything negative about her, which which was is so interesting. So she wasn't ruthless, but she pretty much got what she wanted for herself and for her for her boss. So you gave me the answer on why what the glue was that held them together. What do you think his fascination was with her? His 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 ability to trust her to to the degree that he did. I think it was just that long period of being sort of partners in his recovery. Roosevelt, the the people who he had around him the longest were the people who had been around him the longest. If you had been part of his inner circle in 1920, by golly, you stayed in that inner circle. And that was part of it. You know, she was with him when he was down on his luck and she stuck with him. But, you know, I think there was just, you know, you're just people that you're attracted to. And Missy was a pretty woman. Um, She wasn't beautiful. So I think there was a certain sort of attraction that way. You know, the big question is always, were they lovers? And the the answer to that is, we have no way of knowing. I want to um, hold hold, on, hold off on talking about that for a minute because I yeah, want to go yeah. into that a little bit more in depth because I think yeah, it's, yeah. it's a powerful part of the story. Yeah, I don't good. I don't want yeah. it to be a, a after the comma kind of conversation. But let me ask yeah. you this then, because the other thing that you would have to say about looking at her is she was a politician in her own right. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. Putting women in politics in the same sentence was not all that common back in the late 30s and early 40s. But wasn't she the consummate politician? She certainly was. She certainly was. But that's, I think, like you said, there were very few women in office, Margaret Chase Smith and just a, you know, a very small other. And I think part of Missy's power was that she insisted she had no interest in politics, that she didn't have anything to do with politics, that she never talked to the president about politics. So she could kind of stay under the radar and anyone who wasn't really on the inside would just think, oh, you know, that's the president's secretary. She helps him, you know, run the Oval Office and all that kind of thing. Except. And even Eleanor Roosevelt had a hard time accepting her as a political advisor because Eleanor thought that she was the only woman who had any influence on FDR, and it just wasn't true. Yeah, we're going to talk about Eleanor and their relationship in a second, but I want to get back to this because she wasn't a consummate politician, so to speak, but boy, was she ever. She had a lot of influence over uh, FDR's policies with the New Deal being won and uh, all the the stuff leading up to World War II, Supreme Court appointments, cabinet picks. appointments, yeah. I mean, that's, that's you know, if you're in the White House and you're talking that, you're a politician too. I mean, you know, right? If you're controlling access to the president's office, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, you know, one of my favorite people that she brought into his orbit is Tommy Corcoran, who became the first White House lobbyist in history. And a lot of the people that Missy brought into Epti's or- orbit were Catholics, were Irish Catholics like, like Tommy, and they had just their own little cabal. And Tommy was a very gifted lawyer, had a graduate of Harvard Law, and he first came to the White House at Missy's invitation to play the accordion for the president after dinner. And then he would start showing up and saying, Missy, hey, I was at a cocktail party and I heard this, or the scuttlebutt on Capitol Hill about the bill is yada, yada, yada. And she'd go in and tell FDR, hey, Tommy's out here. And he says this and so. And FDR would say, oh, well, I want to talk to Tommy. Send him in. So Tommy became just a real key player, very, very important to FDR's efforts. Then he brought more Catholic and Jewish and other minority lawyers into the the capitals, into the government, so it was not dominated by all these Ivy League wasps. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Interesting, right? Really changed the really changed the culture in in Washington a lot. Ah, I find that fascinating as well. She worked like a demon. There's no question about mm-hmm. it. Even with all mm-hmm. the uh, health issues that she had. So yeah. let's let's discuss the other side of her life, her personal life. Mm-hmm. The, to me, that's a two prong conversation. Mm-hmm. Did she have a personal life white, out of the White House? I know the answer to that. Let's let you uh, yeah. tell the audience that. Did she date? Yeah, and that was one of the real surprises because everything I'd read about Missy before was like, oh, you know, she was just at the president's beck and call. Any man was terrified to ask her out. And, you know, she didn't do anything if FDR wanted company. And I think to a degree that that was true. He was always the most important person to her and his needs were were on top of everyone else's but she did have a private life and she had a very long lasting love affair with a man named William Christian Bullitt who was with the State Department and he was the the first ambassador to the Soviet Union after they were recognized in 1933 eventually went to Paris and was the ambassador there. And they, you know, would communicate by by letter, and, and she put her letters in the diplomatic pouch, and they would talk on the phone, and he'd come home for very long periods to consult with the president and, you know, see his daughter, and you know, they would go out and, you know, have great times together. But it was obvious to me that, that she was crazy about him as long as he stayed on his side of the Atlantic Ocean. And it really suited her just fine because she loved her job. She loved her job. She loved all the perks of being in the White House. She loved what she did. And when Bullet came home after France fell to the, the Germans in 1940, and started demanding more of her time and attention, she just gave him the kiss off and said, you know, my my friends understand when I have to break engagements at the last minute, and if you can't, just too bad. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I bet at that time to really love your job was probably not something that a lot of people wanted to mm-hmm. accept from a woman in the first yeah. place. Yeah. Uh, and One of the uh, most yeah. um, uh, incisive things I read was by another woman columnist, at one of the newspapers, and she said that that Missy was a thoroughly modern woman who had substituted her job for her family, and she understood that. And she said all the whispering that, oh, she's, you know, got some 
improper relationship with the president is coming from older women who don't understand that this is what a modern woman can do. She can have a job that is, is you know, the most important thing in her life. Yeah. The same was true of Grace Tully, who was Missy's assistant and succeeded her as FDR's private secretary. She didn't have much of a life outside of work. She never married. And uh, he kind of liked to surround himself with people like that because you know, he wanted to be the most important person in their in their life. Did you like him as much uh, after doing all the research and coming across everything that you did as you did going in, FDR? I did. I did, yeah. I mean, I knew that he had to be a, a ruthless person in some regard, but I liked him very much. Good and to know. I liked yeah. the relationship they had, yeah. Okay, so let's get to those pesky little rumors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I can't think... I need <laughs> to do it. Yeah. You got to do it, and I know. I, I, I honestly, uh, uh, it, it goes to the territory with the ter- it, territory, and I think it still does to some degree yeah, when it comes to yeah, women sure. uh, working with, with certain men. But when asked why she had never married, she said something like, "Who could follow FD?" By the way, FD is what she called yeah, FDR. Yeah, uh, and she, and I agree. She said that. Yeah, but she said that fairly early in her life. She said it when she was in her 20s. I said things in my 20s that I would never say now that I'm 60. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I think that things evolve, you know? So so, so let me get into she it. she thought yeah. William Christian Bullitt was a pretty cool guy and, um, you know, told him she loved him and missed him and lived for his visits and all that. So. Yeah, well, he could have been a front for her, too. I mean, you know, there's that, too. I mean, if I'm going to play devil's advocate with all of this, I, and I know it goes against your grain, but, you know, and, yeah, and I, I yeah, read your book I and I was so enthralled by it so that I went and, I, you know, I read everything else because I really now I'm fascinated mm-hmm, by this woman. Mm-hmm. And there's so many varied uh, points of view on it. Uh, there are. But, but Elliot Roosevelt later did, in a book not that long ago, write that he had once seen her sitting on his lap. Is that correct? He did. And he was the one who did the most to impugn her reputation. And why do you think that but, is? For money. Really? And I'll just be frank. When he wrote that book in the 70s, he was broke. And he just wrote a really outlandish book that all the other Roosevelt children disavowed, the other four. His brother James wrote a rebuttal book a couple of years later and, and said he did. He knew. he was James was with his father far more than Elliot. He actually worked in the White House for a period. And he said, I, I, I don't think that she was, was that to my father. I don't think she was his mistress. He said it just, just flat out. But, you know, Elliot saw, said he saw... Saw Missy sitting on his father's lap in her nightgown on his houseboat down the Florida Keys one summer. But Curtis Roosevelt, who was a little boy in the White House at the, at the time, he's a grandson, laughingly said in an interview a couple of years ago that what Elliot didn't mention is that the boat was only 90 feet long and that there were 11 <laughs> other people on in the room at the time. <laughs> if you look at things like Missy's home movies, which I've had the privilege of seeing, people are sitting in each other's laps all over the place. You know, um, one of, of Eleanor Roosevelt's friends, uh, uh, who was a lesbian, was, was sitting in Joseph P. Kennedy's lap. What did that mean? Yeah, no, I yeah. hear you. Yeah, no, I no, I hear you. But, you yeah, know, you could look yeah. at it from both sides, that's for sure. And and, well, and, I, and I, I agree. My, yeah. brother, my brother says if I was sitting on a boat and a girl was sitting in a nightgown in my lap, we would be having an affair. <laughs> <laughs> but but we really don't know and in the and by s- focusing so much on the the love affair the mistress kind of part it it negates Missy's real importance to him, which wasn't, if she was her lover, it wasn't the sex. It was the companionship, it was being his confidant, his advisor, his gatekeeper, so she could have been both. But right, and and no I and 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 when you put it the way you're putting it, I think that that would be far more acceptable than adding the salacious mm-hmm. details to it. But there were always those rumors around FDR and women, anyway. Uh, sure. And and we're he was talking very attractive. <laughs> yeah, right, he was, and and powerful. And, and I don't know which is more attractive, more attractive, attractive or power. I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, it's hard to say. The other side of it, it could have been a one-sided love affair on her part, where she just adored this man so much that nothing mm-hmm. else could ever get in the, mm-hmm. you know, in the way, and that's understandable too. I bring it up because Missy had a very interesting relationship with Mrs. Roosevelt. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And back to the White House and Missy's duties. Mrs. Roosevelt was often absent, and Missy then served as "quote unquote" the first lady. A lot. Yeah, she was the, she uh, was the backup. Right, yeah. and while it appears so, that Missy might have usurped some of Eleanor Roosevelt's duties, may, and maybe her husband. They were great friends too. Let's let's talk. Mm-hmm. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt, such a phen- phenomenal mm-hmm. character mm-hmm. too in history. Yeah, they were, and I think um, it's most likely that that Eleanor was grateful to Missy because 
when uh, it goes back to well the the years at warm springs eleanor didn't like it down there it was dirty it was everybody was poor you know when you went to get a chicken you had the cook had to you had to bring it home live on the hoof and the cook killed it in the yard that was just too much for her she hated the racism in the south and plus she had five children and she would become a real power in politics in new york so she could just leave fdr down there with missy and know that everything was being done properly when he was elected governor of New York, Eleanor was very unhappy about that because she owned a uh, was part owner of a school in New York, and she didn't want to stop teaching. So she went and taught three days a week and left Missy in charge of the governor's mansion when she was gone, and that just escalated as first lady because she, you know, became the incredible first lady that we we all know. Traveled so widely, her Secret Service name was Rover. Was the president's ears and eyes and legs in many respects, but also had her own count causes that he didn't subscribe to, and she could depend on Missy to be doing things right while she was gone and not trying to usurp her job as first lady. I mean, she was never referred to, she would be referred to as the backup hostess, but never the backup first lady. Right. Eleanor was always the first lady. And anyone who didn't understand that got her, got her ire. <laughs> I, I can imagine. She was formidable, that Eleanor Roosevelt, no yeah. doubt about it. A different thing that I did want to ask you about, and that's the other controversy, because there, there's some people who think that Missy along the way suffered nervous breakdowns. It was more than just mm-hmm. her heart. And where are you on all of that? Well, th- that was um, that was what was most often said is that she'd had you know nervous breakdown. She had one in Warm Springs in 1927. But one of the first pieces of, of primary material I found was her health records, and she had not been having nervous breakdowns. She was having atrial fibrillation, mm-hmm. her heart, and that's a real common thing to happen with someone who had heart damage from rheumatic fever. They would put her on digitalis to regulate her heartbeat, to slow down her heartbeat, and she had toxic reactions to the digitalis. It just sent her over the edge. So observing her, if you didn't know any better, you'd think, yeah, she had had a nervous breakdown. You know, she was just off her head, but she had what was called um, digitalis toxication. Yeah, which is like speed. It's like it'll make everybody, it makes you anxious to the point of like crazy. I I wanted to bring that up real quick. So so let's go here because to me the end of her life. Oh my gosh, it, it's heartbreaking in a way. Yeah. It, it, it's just it it's, is, un- it's a heartbreaking right? in every way. <laughs> it is. It is. It's unfathomable yeah. in a way. Uh, qu- yeah. You know, quick meteoric uh, rise and then this terrible thing. She has a stroke. What a twist mm-hmm. of fate. And she couldn't mm-hmm. speak. And and she had been so much of partly a, paralyzed. Right, partly yeah. paralyzed and had been so much of uh, FDR's voice for him and now she's rendered speechless and because what because she's i'm doing this in the interest of time because she's uh, a federal employee um ultimately she had to leave the white house and go go to her family to be cared for because she had been you know that um, debilitated by the original stroke and mm-hmm. oh my gosh i mean here's something that i, I uh, second stroke 44 years young mm-hmm. she's got during that time between the first stroke and when she finally got went, what was her relationship with FDR? She went to Warm Springs for a period of time and came back to the White House for a few months in 1942, but just didn't function. So he sent her home to her family in Massachusetts, and after May of 1942, he never saw her again. That, that, and it's, yeah. it's just it's awful to think about. You know, you can say, well, we were in the middle of World War II by then. He was kind of a busy guy. Um, his health was awful. It was, it was, traveling was always difficult for him. But I think at the end, he just couldn't handle it, that he just couldn't bear to see Missy that way. He would call, he would write, he would send, send some really lovely gifts. He paid all her medical bills. But I think the one thing she would have really loved was to see him and, Finally, the, in 1944, he and Grace Tully, who was then his private secretary, arranged for her to come to stay at the White House for a week. And when Eleanor found out about it, she said that wasn't convenient for her and canceled the trip. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't know if, if Eleanor was just it remembered how hard it was to get Missy out of the White House after the first stroke or if she had other reasons for not wanting her there. But but he did put her in his will. She shared half the income of his estate. Yeah, let's, um, I want to, I want to, get the yeah, other half. right, I want to be emphatic about that because that, that yeah, to me is the yeah. most interesting thing in the world. He left half of his mm-hmm. estate to Missy. 
half of the income. Of the in, right, but half, half of, of the, the income, income yeah. which is... To pay for her medical cost, and the other half to Eleanor. But by the time, it didn't really mean anything because she died before he did. But it did say something, that she was that important to him. And he told his son James, um, it was the least I could do. She had served me for so well for so long and asked so little in return. And that redeems him in large degree in my mind. And also that really touching fact that his family is still paying for the upkeep of her grave all these years later. She's buried in a beautiful cemetery in um, Cambridge, Mount Auburn, and um, they are still paying for that upkeep. Here you do all, you, you fall into the story, you do all this extraordinary research. You went through some stuff of your own with health issues, mm. which I think yeah. you felt that you yeah. shared in common. I've had, I've had breast cancer at the same age Missy had her stroke. Right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, that, that, that'll connect you in, in one sense to, to her. Mm. I get that. But mm. this had to be as much your journey, Catherine, mm-hmm. as it was, you know, their journey and telling their story. So, so, and she lives on so beautifully in your book. As you were writing the last chapter of her life, what were you thinking? Uh, oh, I got so depressed <laughs> writing the last couple of chapters. You know, when when her health broke down, like you said, to go from that pinnacle to just being, you know, unable to even talk. I know I was just depressed for weeks because it is just so sad. But I'm really happy that now Missy's story has been told in a redeeming sort of way, and people can continue to think what they want to think, but there's this alternative now that she was important, that she was powerful, that she was respected, that she was a good government servant, that she was just a good, decent person. So I'm I'm really glad. I feel really honored that I was able to, to put this story together and find a publisher that believed in it. A woman before her time. Woman before her time, yeah. Absolutely. I've been speaking with journalist Catherine Smith, author of a compelling new biography, The Gatekeeper, Missy Lahand, FDR, and the untold story of the partnership that defined a presidency. For more information on Catherine Smith and her book, visit com. You are listening to The Helly Caster Jane Show. My guests today are journalist Catherine Smith, author of The Gatekeeper, and Mark Wortman, author of 1941, Fighting the Shadow War. We'll be back in a minute. Stay with us. And we are back. And you are listening to The Hallie Caster Chain Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Conventional wisdom dictates that the U.S. entered World War II in retaliation for the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 8, 1941. Historian Mark Wortman sees it another way. In his new book, 1941, Fighting the Shadow War, A Divided America in a World at War, Wortman compellingly reveals the ways in which America played an increasingly significant and clandestine role in the war in the months and years prior to officially joining the battle. Time to the 75th anniversary year of U.S. entry into World War II, Wortman skillfully interweaves military, political, and social history, populating his work with perennially fascinating characters like Churchill, Lindbergh, both branches of the Roosevelt family, at odds over the idea of going to war, FDR advisor and emissary Harry Hopkins, and finally journalists William Shearer and Philip Johnson, who would become a renowned architect. Shearer, fervently anti-Nazi, and Johnson, a Nazi sympathizer. Wortman, the author of two previous books, has written for many popular publications, including Smithsonian, Vanity Fair, and Town and Country. And his essays and reviews appear frequently on The Daily Beast. Let's talk. Mark, gotta say, it, this is really well done, nicely done. One of your reviewers said, 1941 has the sweep and intimacy of an epic novel and military thriller. And I just want you to know that I concur. But let's start with this, okay? Why take it on? This has been explored before. Where do you want to go? What stimulated? What got you into it? What's this all about for you? Sure. Well, let me first talk about when you say it's been done before. It actually, while many aspects of the period before U.S. entry into World War II have been studied, there have been very few people who have looked at the way in which what was going on in the American scene was reflecting 
what was going on elsewhere in the world and how what was going on in the wars in other places in the world was was also reflecting back the domestic issues in American politics. I mean, Hitler was very, very aware of the battle between the isolationists and the interventionists in the U.S. And Japan was also very aware that they were facing embargoes of vital aviation fuel, particularly from the United States. So what happened in the United States had a big effect on the war. And that story really hasn't been told fully, nor has the story of how the U.S. was both debating whether it should be going to war and going to war simultaneously. I mean, the United States military forces were deep into the combat zones, and American military personnel were dying in combat way before Pearl Harbor. So that story isn't as well known as it should be. So let's get into the weeds of some of this that you do in this terrific book, all right? Pre-war stage, World War II. And I had to put it like this, but I'm going to go with me here. World War II today is just about the world's perfect war. We won. The Allies won. We think yeah. World War II and we think rah, rah, sis, boom, bah. My father, and now I know from reading your book, your father, men of the greatest generation, couldn't wait to fight the crowds. At least my dad. I know that. And his friends and the Japs. And yet you write of a reluctant America. Your subtitle, Divided America in a World at War. In fact, you call it the most conflicted generation. I think a lot of people would be surprised by that. Yes, indeed. Uh, and you had earlier asked about some of the motivations for writing this book. And one of the motivations was certainly that my father, I'm a baby boomer, my father and all the fathers that I knew had been in the war. And it was the greatest event in American history, certainly since the Civil War, the most important event. And it overshadowed our lives. But what I wanted to know was, so the U.S. did not get into the war in Europe for more than two years after the war started. And I asked, why didn't we get into that war? Why didn't we stop Hitler before the worst of the Holocaust. I come from a Jewish background, and I was always very aware that we had a very small family beyond the family members who who had immigrated to America well before the war. So why didn't we intervene when Hitler could have been stopped? And why didn't we make more of an effort to force back the Japanese out of China before the, the horrors that took place there? I mean, these were really serious questions. And, and And I also wanted to know, what did it feel like to be a lone great power nation at peace in a world that was completely in flames? You know, what what was their thinking that was going on? And yes, we do tend to look at that generation, that greatest generation, through the lens of their heroism and going and doing the job of... uh, of in being their part in that grand alliance that won World War II. And we have these memories of, of the, the, the good war, the war in which the nation was united, and that brought the end of conflict in Asia and Europe. But in fact, that generation was not so much different than, than today's world in the sense that before Pearl Harbor, the United States was incredibly divided. You say, well, uh, they wanted to get into the war. No, in fact, Americans really, by and large, did not want to get into the war. Most polls taken during the period showed that the American population was really scared about what was going on in Europe, thought it posed a serious danger to the United States, and they did not want to send American boys to fight. There's that that really deep conflict uh, and and paradox that you, on the one hand, you had American people saying it would be a disaster for us if Great Britain loses the war, you know, because there was a really serious danger that Great Britain might be forced to capitulate, and Americans saying, well, the last thing we really want to do is to have Americans go over there and fight the war, you know. So um actually took Pearl Harbor and a declaration of war by Hitler against the United States <laughs> for us to finally get into the war. Great cast of characters. I don't even know if we make people quite like them, although I don't know, maybe Trump is uh, 
as grandiose as some of the characters. Yeah. Well, in, certainly in his own mind. <laughs> right. Back my, in the day. My, my, my apologies to uh, Trump fans out there. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, it's really interesting to me. Let's let's look at Roosevelt for a second. I mean, you know, he, he was really quite the character. And history has been kind to him in many ways, but not in all. He was a wily politician, that's for sure. He had a pulse on the hearts and minds of his constituents. And he was a reluctant warrior by nature. We know that. Anti-Semite? You and I are both of Jewish heritage. You know you know what the conversation is. We voted for our families, voted for him, and then why didn't he save our families? There's all of that. Well, what was your, and briefly, because I really have a lot of people I want to talk to you about, take on, on Roosevelt? Well, very briefly, he was a Hamlet. He was torn. He believed that he had to do everything to keep the British in the fight, that they were our first line of defense. But he also understood that the American people were not ready to go to war. He believed, particularly by the time 1941 rolled along, he believed that the United States was going to have to fight this war. And yet he said, I'm not willing to fire the first shot. You know, he had promised the Americans in when he ran for president in 1940 for an unprecedented third term that he would not send Americans to fight a foreign war unless we were attacked. And so he was doing everything he could to provoke attack by Hitler. And at the same time, he was really unwilling to do anything that would be perceived as having directly gone to war. He wasn't willing to go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war. Let's bring in Winston Churchill. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. We, we always have to bring in Winston <laughs> Churchill. He's, 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 he is bigger than life. If there's anybody bigger than life, it's Winston Churchill. Seriously. You know, you say that name, and don't you just get that picture of him, that grandiose figure that he was, yeah. you know? Yeah. Fascinating yeah. guy. Talk a little bit about him and, and, and his uh, his position. Sure. Sure. Well, Winston Churchill was at the start of the war. He was brought in as the in 1939 as the first Lord of the Admiralty, basically the head of the British Navy. And then after Germany invaded the lowlands in France, he became the prime minister. When he became prime minister in the midst of the war, he said, all the paths I've taken in life brought me to here. And I felt entirely comfortable to have this war in my hands. There was a man who was a warrior to the very soles of his feet, who was entirely confident in his role there and in his nation's ability to withstand what the Germans were throwing at them. However, he also faced a terrible, terrible situation because the British Isles are an island nation, and they were dependent for so much foodstuffs, scrap metal, many of the weapons that they were using, oil from shipments coming in convoys, and the Germans were sending out these U-boat wolf packs and sinking the ships, the freighters, at uh, such a fast rate that there was a serious danger that his nation could not withstand it. He began to write pleading letters to FDR asking for more and more U.S. aid. And he did what for him was an incredibly painful thing, which was giving up some of the uh, Crown's colonies, giving the U.S. basing rights. This was a man who was deeply uh, royalist. He was a big believer in the British Empire. But he wanted to get the American destroyers because they were so desperate. And occasionally he would write letters to FDR basically saying, you don't want to be responsible for England having to capitulate. And he said, I won't surrender, but my government might fall at the onslaught from the Nazis. And if it does, who's to say what the next government will be? So he was really tugging at FDR's heart because FDR did not want to lose Great Britain to the Nazis. And we have to say that FDR came to his rescue. And this is like one of the quiet things. And I'm, I'm going to say this so that we can go on because there's all oh, these characters I just want to yak with you about. Um, mm-hmm. And then he gave the Lend-Lease program, which was basically giving them what boats and things that they needed to fight the war without going to Congress per se and saying, give us money for the war. It was it was a game, correct? Yes, yes. He told the American people we're going to become the arsenal of democracy. He didn't say the army of democracy, he said the arsenal of democracy. 
And basically what he did was convince Congress that if they gave him the power to provide what weapons, whatever he deemed necessary for national security to, to any nation that the president chose that served the national security interests, that he would be free to do this and to do it as a loan, not in return for payment. This really released Britain from the terrible burden. They were essentially bankrupt of having to figure out how to pay for these weapons. So FDR started supplying everything he could to the British. Much of that ended up at the bottom of the ocean, you know, because these convoys were being sunk by the U-boats. But speaking of characters, when we talk about, uh, in my book, when we talk about Len Lease, and we talk about Churchill, we have to talk about Harry Hopkins. Can I tell you how much in love I am with Harry Hopkins and have been for years? <laughs> <laughs> Great, I, man. I, to me, Harry Hopkins is, he, if there's one true hero of, of my book, it's Harry Hopkins. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to me, Harry Hopkins is the man who saved civilization and did it in 1941. Harry Hopkins, for for your listeners who don't know about him, was the uh, he ran the WPA during the uh, Great Depression, the early part of the Roosevelt administration. He was the son of a of a harness maker from Iowa. He had a uh, he was educated as a social worker, but had proved to be a, a great administrator. And he was even spoken of as a possible successor to FDR as president. But then he got deadly ill, and he had surgery that removed a big chunk of his stomach. And after that, he was chronically malnourished. He he was skeletal. There were f- uh, famous photographs of him with, uh, he had at one point borrowed Churchill's hat because he lost his own, and the hat was so big that it came down over his ears. It happened that the very night Germany invaded France, Harry Hopkins was at the White House. He was feeling ill. FDR invited him to stay over the night, and he was the man who came to dinner and never left. He stayed and lived on in the White House through most of the the rest of World War II. He lived in what was known as the Lincoln Study then, and uh, he and FDR got together every night, sat around together talking about the day's events. Uh, He became very much FDR's closest confidant and in some ways his alter ego. FDR put him in charge of Lend-Lease, so he was after the WPA when he ran the largest employment agent program in American history. With Lend-Lease, he ran the largest armaments agency in American history. But he did more than that. FDR sent him to England. FDR didn't know Churchill. And what he knew about him, he didn't particularly like. You know, Churchill was a royalist. He believed firmly in the British Empire, the largest colonial empire in history. And Churchill was also known as a heavy drinker and uh, something of a loose cannon. So uh, FDR wasn't sure he was going to be able to work with this man. Then he sent Harry Hopkins to meet with him, and Hopkins and Churchill got along brilliantly. You know, this this sort of crude, very straight-talking man from the American Midwest and this old English royalist aristocrat got along famously. And Hopkins did everything he could to convince FDR that the United States had to do whatever it could to save Great Britain. And May have saved everybody, that Harry Hopkins. Yep. Great yep. guy. I'm going to jump ahead because there's so much, as I said, I want to talk about. And, and I, want to, I want to juxtapose two people who come up in this story. And one of them is a Nazi sympathizer. And the other becomes one of the great journalists of all time, in my opinion. And mm-hmm. those two men, William Shearer, he was a Murrow boy, for those who don't know, Edward R. Murrow. He went on to write, by the way, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, one of the great books about the war. And then he, he up against Philip Johnson. Yikes. Yeah. Good luck putting that in two minutes. Have fun. <laughs> Okay. All right. Very quickly, just to uh, remind your listeners, uh, Philip Johnson was the 20th century's most influential and many minds most important architect. But little known during the 1930s, he had become enamored of Nazi Germany. He attended a a rally with Hitler uh, even before Hitler came to power. He returned to a Nuremberg rally, and there is good reason to, to believe that he had become an agent for Germany. He went with William Shire 
on uh, at the start of World War II, he went with the German army into Poland. And the two were forced to room together by the German propaganda ministry. And William Shire, in his Berlin diary, which he published in 1941, and, and that became a major bestseller, William Shire called him, called him out as an American Nazi. And so the two of them are, in my book, kind of foils. Their, their lives intersect in very surprising ways. And then in later years, when the FBI started cracking down, or later in 1941, when the FBI started cracking down on German agents and uh, Nazi um, activists in this country, they went after Johnson. They never ended up arresting him, but they uh, interviewed Shire about him. And uh, you can read all of this in Johnson's FBI file. But Johnson was a very vocal, active uh, American Nazi who was attempting to basically bring fascism across the ocean. Here's the uh, interesting thing about him, though. He gets his butt saved by, of all people, Nelson Rockefeller. Yeah. Yeah. What? Now, there's, I speculate about this, but I think, I think it's, it's pretty uh, convincing. So Nelson Rockefeller had an interesting role in this period. Nelson Rockefeller was a young man. He was, he was about the same age as Philip Johnson then, in his early 30s. And Nelson Rockefeller had become something of an expert on South America. And he thought of Latin America, South America as our soft underbelly because the Germans had been cultivating relationships there. The Germany had agents throughout South America. They wanted to keep the flow of oil and rubber and uh, some metals that were valuable for war industries coming from South America. It's no accident that many Nazis after the war fled to uh, places like Paraguay and Argentina. And Rockefeller was aware of the situation. He went to FDR and FDR asked him to establish an agency to focus on South America. And, and that became something of a of an intelligence network uh, with the role of, of both providing cultural ambassadors and to develop a, a better image for the United States in South America, but also to ferret out German agents and to uh, try and uh, end trade between Germany and South America. And he was quite successful at this. Now, Nelson Rockefeller in the uh, years, uh, in earlier years, his family wa were the major funders for the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Uh, and Nelson Rockefeller was, his mother was the president. Nelson Rockefeller was on the board of directors. And Philip Johnson established the architecture department at the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, in New York City. And Rockefeller considered himself something of a connoisseur of architecture. He was involved in the design of Rockefeller Center. Uh, and he knew Philip Johnson very well. And when the FBI and Congress were going after Nazi agents in the United States, and eventually there was a there were a series of indictments, and Philip Johnson was one of the names that was brought up but of all the people in Johnson's circle, he was the only one who was never indicted. Mm, 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 and, mm, mm. and I have to believe that Nelson Rockefeller said that this would not look good for our family if, if this man who helped to put the Museum of Modern Art on the map uh, was, uh, was put to trial, was indicted as a, as a Nazi agent. Absolutely so. fascinating story. And now here comes the real boogeyman for me. Ready? Charles Lindbergh. Oh, Charles Lindbergh. Oh. Yeah. Well, so Charles Lindbergh is a is a a complex man. You know, he was of course uh, a hero to most Americans. This was the man who was the first to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. This the Lone Eagle, Lucky Lindy, and Americans revered him. They absolutely revered him. And he was a brilliant man. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. But he, during the 1930s, another American who went over to Nazi Germany and was smitten with what he saw there. 
he went over on an aviation inspection tour a couple times. Uh, he, he happened also to be there during the uh, and attended the 1936 Berlin Olympics. But he came over as a guest of the German government, and they treated him royally, rolled out the red carpet to show him the German aviation industry. And they had a pretty wily view of what they were up to. They wanted him to see just how advanced German aviation was. And he came away deeply impressed. But they also tricked him into thinking that they had a much larger air force than they did. And he came back, gave a report saying that no nation on earth uh, and no combination of nations on earth could compete with the German aviation, the German Luftwaffe. He told this to Joseph Kennedy, the uh, U.S. ambassador to London, uh, father of John Kennedy. And Joseph Kennedy became convinced that Great Britain was going to lose the war. He told FDR, there's no reason for us to waste our treasure, our uh, limited mil military resources on the British. They're going to lose anyway. Lindbergh came back to the United States and began a campaign to keep the United States isolated f from the war, to keep the U.S. from intervening in the war. He had a number of motives for this. Well, let me let me jump in because I'm watching the clock. And let me let me just, because there's someplace I want to go with you on this that you might find sure. interesting, which is he, he started really fighting against getting the war started, right? And he called it the, what, Committee for America First. Yes. Now, there are two okay. things that I want to go real quickly with you on. First on that, which is last night I actually heard on Fox News, somebody, not Fox, it was on CNN, somebody say, America first, it comes straight out of Charles Lindbergh, Donald Trump. I almost yeah. plotted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's been amazing. You know, when I when I started writing this book, I was thinking, okay, well, um, among among the things to think about is we're coming up on the 75th anniversary right. of Pearl Harbor, and this is this is a big and momentous anniversary. The, a lot of the veterans are uh, have have gone to their rewards, um, and and this is this is an important event. But what I hadn't realized was that that this period would be would be recycled in so many ways now right and uh, you know when you talk about the anti foreign fears the anti uh, anti refugee statements the raise our walls high america first all of this is language straight out of lindbergh's speeches from uh, from 1941, Lindbergh was going around as the spokesman for America First. He would draw crowds that would number in the tens of thousands out where he would basically deride foreign interests that were pushing America into this war. A lot of this was veiled references to Jews. And if I can just do a quick detour here, I spent a lot of time going through Lindbergh's personal diaries, the actual ones that he wrote out at the end of each day. They were published, large segments of them were published, but all of the references to Jews in them were expurgated. And reading these diaries, the man was obsessed. He spent page after page in these diaries writing about Jews, about their huge influence that he believed, despite all evidence to the contrary, was pushing the country against its will into the war. He believed that Jews were sabotaging his his rallies. He thought that Jews were deliberately juxtaposing him with Hitler in newsreels. And he finally came out in public and said that blaming the Jews for reasons that he said were other than American for pushing an unwilling America into war. And that that caused huge controversy. Well, let's put it succinctly. He was an anti-Semite. Well, uh, we have to be very careful about this. Why? He was an, uh, because this he was not an anti... I know some people who knew him, and he was not an anti-Semite in sort of a traditional, in a, in a vulgar way. He wasn't somebody who would sit there and say, oh, I'm not going to work with this guy because he's Jewish. I'm not going to sit there, uh, sit next to this woman because she's Jewish. He, he wasn't like that at all. What he was was somebody who, who, who believed that Jews as a, as a, as a national group were other than American, had their own, acted in their own self-interest 
and separated themselves from Americans. And in that sense, he was deeply anti-Semitic. And he said things like, you know, Jews were going to bring down violence upon themselves. And he thought it was going to be worse in America than it was in Germany. So yes, in that sense, he was anti-Semitic, but you know, we have to be, we have to be careful. There's, there are nuances here. I don't know where I come from. No nuances. You either are or you aren't. <laughs> okay, but well, hey, you know, you know, let's not get into the weeds there. Listen, this book is yeah. terrific. There's so much in here. We didn't even get into to, to uh, Pearl Harbor or to some of the uh, Japanese spy who you who you uh, mention in the book and go into in great detail. There's just so much. And and I want to I want to end on this. I mean, kudos to you. You even went so far as to speak to a woman who had survived the the attack at Pearl Harbor. Phenomenal piece of work. Got to give it to you. Applause, applause. I've been speaking with Mark Wortman, author of 1941: Fighting the Shadow War, A Divided America in a World at War, by way of Atlantic Monthly Press. For more information on this terrific read, visit markwortmanbooks.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to the LA Catcher Chain Show, a production of Resac LLC. Associate producer, Suzanne Probst. Music by Tony Rivales Jazz. Visit Hallie Chain. <laughs>